difficult to stop. I could talk about this forever, Lord, but uh, anyway, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're with us this morning. I thank you that we can honor you, and I thank you, Lord, that you're going to speak to us now, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All righty, so the title I put on this this morning, like I said, I think we're going to end this series, if you will. This is the f- this is 15th week on the covenant. 15 weeks, man. That's a long time. Shoot. What the? Almost four months. <laughs> That's a long, long time. So the, this week, uh, the title that I put then, this was The Ultimate Friendship. <clears throat> Ready? Say that with me. The ultimate friendship. Right. Let's do this. You ready? <clears throat> Listen to this first line. You ready? It's the covenant that fulfills the longing of God. Let me say that again. It's the covenant that fulfills the longing of God. Granting men and women the gift of his life so that in this present time... They lived the life of the age to come. Ecclesiastes says what is has been before and what will be will be like Vinny said, they'll be again. <laughs> this gift makes them his children or makes us, let's personalize it. This gift makes us his children, giving us the unspeakable privilege of enjoying intimate friendship with the Lord. Intimate friendship with the Lord. If you were in my wife's Sunday school class this morning, she uh, read Psalm 25, 14. I'm not saying that she, you know, stole it from me, but, you know, coincidence or, you know, the leading of the Lord, whatever. But in Psalm 25, 14, in the New King James Version, it says, The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. This may be one of the most amazing verses in the entire Bible. Putting into one sentence, if you will, the incredible plan God has purposed for humankind to show us his covenant. The union described by the Hebrew word for secret is paralleled in the same verse with covenant. The uniting of God and man in the strong bond of friendship is achieved by the covenant, the covenant that God has made with us. The secret of the Lord, that phrase, the secret of the Lord, is a translation of a rich Hebrew word that takes many, many, many words and ideas to translate it into English. You can't just translate it with our language like that. The word portrays persons who have their heads close together in private sharing. A tight-knit group of intimate friends. It speaks of friends with a life and death commitment to one another. In an atmosphere of unconditional trust in one another. A place where it's safe to share one's weaknesses and sorrows, as well as strengths and victories. Knowing that one is not rejected, but loved and given the strength of the group in the day of weakness. That's a lot, man. That's a lot. It speaks of loyalty, faithfulness, and enduring friendship. Now, it's incredible enough when such a relationship is is found among human beings, if you will. But church... Think about this. This verse is speaking of the relationship of men and women with the Lord. With the Lord. We can have that. We can have that. But again, it just doesn't happen, you know, because you wish it's going to happen. Right? I think a lot of people, and even talking with the covenant, because I know that throughout this whole study in the covenant, you know, it looks like God does it all, and he did. But, say but, but. we got to do what we got to do. 
You know, it doesn't just happen, right? It doesn't just happen. God loves the world. We know this, right? John 3, 16. For God so what? That he gave his only begotten son, right? So he loves the world, but, say but. but. Believers are his circle of intimate friends with whom he shares his heart. God does not share his heart with the whole world. He loves them, but they ain't getting the scoop. They ain't, get, they ain't privy to the inside stuff. They are not. Thank you, Jesus. That is for us. That's for us. Every believer has been called to such a relationship with God in Jesus Christ and in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit because that's who brings this whole thing together. Again, no Holy Spirit, no covenant. No Holy Spirit, no covenant. Those pastors and preachers and teachers who talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit were for then, and, you know, that's not applicable today, or I don't even know where they come up with that nonsense that, like, the Holy Spirit isn't applicable for today. I mean, that's all we got. He's it. He's it. He's everything, right? So every believer is called to this kind of relationship. It's this kind of friendship with him that is potential in our new birth. So when we got saved, this is the potential we were immediately given. We got saved in all of this that we've been talking about, 15 weeks of it, are available to us. Thank you, Jesus. Bless that little baby, Lord. <laughs> we were saved from sin for such a relationship. So many people in Christianity think that God died on the cross strictly to save us, to take away our sins, so that someday we can walk through the gates of heaven. That's so, you have just belittled it. It's so belittled, that kind of thinking. It's, God saved us from our sin so that we can now have intimate, close relationship and fellowship with him. He had to get rid of our sin Otherwise, we couldn't come in his presence. He had to get clean us up first, right, in order for us to be with him, to have a relationship with him. That's why he died on the cross. It's not just so my sins are forgiven. Big deal. What's that? My sins are forgiven so that I can have intimate covenant relationship with the creator of the universe. <laughs> Holy cow. Amen. We have been saved out of, out of the world to become friends of God, part of his inner circle. Now, if you know that or not, that's on you. But I'm telling you, if you're saved this morning, you can be part of the inner circle of God. You can know even the deep things of God. You can know the secrets of the Lord. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can. Right. You can. The new covenant makes it possible to live on the earth as those whose true center and sphere of life is in heaven. Now, ah, check that out. That's deep as it gets. Right now, Frank, you, me, all of us, I have the ability, it's there before me, to live my life here on this earth as if I was living it in heaven. Whoo! Woo! Woo! So do I have an excuse? Do I have an excuse to be a bonehead? I, I really don't. I don't. I could say, I could, I could try to make an excuse. I don't have an excuse, but it's, it's sad. It's, it's sad. It should sadden us all when I live so, so beneath what I am empowered to be. It's sad because I don't have to do that. I can live my life right now as if it's in heaven. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Now that whole verse sounds kind of strange when we're speaking of friends who delight in each other in a place of safety, 
right? If I'm with the Lord, I'm saved. What's this fool? Why am I fearing him? We have to understand that the phrase, the fear of the Lord, we know this, describes those who have entered the circle of his intimate friendship. The word fear means to stand in awe of, respect, honor, and submit to. Submit to. Submit to. Right? In a phrase that is the Old Testament, in a, in a phrase that in the Old Testament describes the character of faith that we have in God, we stand in awe of Him, giving Him honor and respect, and in obedience we submit to Him. It also carries the idea that we trust Him and expect Him to keep His word to us. It's okay for me to do that, it's okay for me to hold God to His standard. He wants me to. He wants us to. Hallelujah. The Bible knows nothing of faith being a formula whereby we can extract something from God. Did you hear what I just said? The Bible knows nothing of faith being a formula whereby we can extract something from God. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Faith is our response of trust to the revelation God has given us of himself. Do you hear that? Faith is a response of trust to the revelation that God has given us of himself. See, I can trust my wife. Let me make it easy for you guys. I can trust my wife because I know her character. I can trust my wife because my wife has revealed to me who she is. So I have faith in my wife. If my wife says something, I, I don't doubt it. I have faith in her. Does that make sense? So I have my faith isn't about me. It's about what he has shown me of himself. That's where my faith rises from. Sinful fear is when we transfer our fear from God to another human being or humans, if you will, or even to the demonic. When I'm fearing people or fearing the spiritual or fearing anything, what I'm really doing, I'm disrespecting God. Why? Because we then give to them the respect and awe and submissive expectancy that belongs only to the Lord. That's why there is no spirit of fear has not been given to anybody in this room. Fear is not of God. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be afraid. That's a whole different ball game. You know what I mean? I'm talking about fear. I remember I was forced one time to, well, a couple times actually back in, I had to go see psychiatrists. You know, I was mandated, if you will. I remember this one lady, man, she kept trying to, she just kept gnawing at me, this little skinny anorexic lady. (laughs) She wanted me to admit, you know, that I was depressed. Are you depressed? 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 She asked me a thousand times. I said, no, I'm not depressed. I said, are you asking me, do I ever get depressed? Sure. But I'm not depressed. So do I get afraid sometimes? Yes. Everybody gets afraid. But I'm not living in fear. Big difference. Big difference. So that's what I'm talking about. See, we give to them the respect and awe and submissive expectancy that belongs only to God when we're living in fear. We fear them, so we believe in their power to do us harm instead of believing in and submitting to the love of God that is greater than all designs that any enemy or anything can ever bring up against us. So fear determines who am I trusting? Am I trusting God or not? Do I believe his word? Do I believe what he says as I'm covenantly joined to him or not? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
if the heart of the covenant is to be united as one to him by the spirit, the goal of the covenant is to know him. The goal of the covenant is to know him. So if I have these things, I have to ask myself, do I know him? Do I really know him? Hallelujah. The word know is a rich word in both the Hebrew and the Greek. We've touched on this in the past a little bit, but today I'm going to hit it hard. In the Hebrew, the word is yada. It describes the knowledge that comes from observation, intimate knowledge, uniting knowledge. It's knowledge gained by experience with the senses, by investigation and proving, by reflection and consideration. It's firsthand knowledge, yada. The opposite of this word is to know about. To know by secondhand information. It's the difference between a student's relationship to the material they studied and the relationship between a husband and a wife. Yada is the word of intimacy, it's a covenant union. It's, co it's consistently used to describe marriage in the Word of God which is the most sacred of all human covenants, if you will, right? Marriage. It's the knowing of the whole person. It's also referred to as uncovering the nakedness of another. The ultimate covenant act of having no secrets and nothing held back. Such is the relationship that we're called to with God through Jesus Christ. Yada. Yada could sum up Moses' whole life. Let me read a couple scriptures to you. They're probably up there. Exodus 33. Verse 17. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. I yada you, Moses. Deuteronomy 34.10. But since, but since then there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who the Lord knew face to face. The Old Testament prophets continu continually refer to the relationship of Israel to the Lord as a marriage. And in the New Testament, Christ is described as being married to the church. Yada describes experiential knowledge in which the one knowing has actual involvement with the other. So you can read an autobiography all you want. You don't know nothing about that person. You just know it was in a book. You have no experiential interaction with that person. You don't know anything. You just know facts. But you don't know the person, right? Yada describes experiential knowledge in which the one knowing has actual involvement with the other person. To know God is to have intimate and experiential hands-on knowledge with him. Yada is not sentimental, but is the expression of the faith that obeys the Lord. Pharaoh refused to let Israel go. Why? Well, Exodus 5.2 tells us. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Now, church, he meant that. <laughs> when he said that, he meant it, right? 
although he certainly knew of the Lord intellectually, he heard about him. He heard about Israel's God. He heard. He knew, he knew if you will, up here. He didn't recognize his authority over him in his personal life or in the decisions that he makes. I don't know this God. He ain't telling me what to do. He ain't running my life. I run this show, right? And them people ain't going nowhere. Else. I don't care what your God says. Right? Isn't that what he said? There is no greater description of the meaning of Yada than that given by Jesus in the upper room when he spoke of knowing and abiding in the love of a triune God. But he made it very plain, church. He made it very, very plain to us. It was not a sentimental feeling of romantic love, but a human expression in keeping his commands. In keeping his commands. In John chapter 14, Twenty-one to twenty-four. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Is it up there? Yeah. Did I write that? Boy, that Frank. He just he's always telling us what we're supposed to do. I ain't telling you nothing. God's telling you what to do. Your problem's not with me. Your problem's with him. So quit blaming me. Simple as that. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And not to the world. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. We could change that a little bit. This is, I'm not saying blasphemy here. But we could say that if, if you do not keep my words, then guess what? You don't love me. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So Jesus is saying the same thing I'm saying. Don't blame me. Your problem's with God. Your problem's with God. If, I, if I'm professing that I love the Lord, if I'm professing to be a man of God, a Christian, and not doing what God tells me to do in his word, I'm full of it. I'm full of it. That's what the Lord just said. You do whatever you want with it. The intimacy with God that the word speaks of is linked with the revelation of his purposes. His purposes are, do what I ask you to do. That's all I'm asking you. If you love me, then you'll do what I'll do. And if you do what I'll do, guess what? We will come. We. The three of us. We will come and we will make our home with you. I mean, that's, that's a perk, if you ask me. That's a perk. So when we don't do what God asks us to do, right, and then we wonder why, don't wonder. <laughs> don't wonder why. God, you're, you're not finding favor with the Lord because you're not doing what he asks you to do. It's as simple as that. It's his show. It's his show. It's not ours. It's his. And that goes all the way across the board. We can't just, you know, the little things. We can't keep using the excuse, well, I'm only human. We can't keep using the excuse, you know. We can't. We can't. We are covenant people empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have the all of heaven at our beck and call. All of it. Right now, church, let me remind you, I've said this before. Right now, you are, all of heaven's attention is on you. All of heaven's attention is on you. 
The Father's there. He's seeing it all. Jesus is praying for you. The Holy Spirit's down here with you, trying to help you. The angels are sent to minister to you. All of heaven. All of heaven. You don't think you're important? All of heaven. Are, they're all, their attention is on us. This is covenant. This is covenant. The intimacy with God that the word speaks of is linked with the revelation of his purposes. The New Testament word is gnosko. Gets better. Meaning to understand completely. To be taken in knowledge. To come to know. To recognize. And to understand. The word indicates that who or what is known is of great value or importance to the one who knows. Did you hear what I just said? So God who knows us. Gnosko says, the one or what is known by him is of great importance to him because he knows you. And hence the relationship is now established. It's the definition Jesus gives us of eternal life. It's the definition that Jesus gives us of eternal life. Guys, hang in with me here. This is wild. John chapter 17 and verse 3. And this is eternal life. Now, most of you in the room say, I know what eternal life is. When I die, I go to heaven and I live eternally. Or someone dies and they go to hell and they burn eternally. That's eternal life. That's what most of us think eternal life is. Well, this is eternal life. Okay? That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life, that I know God. That I know God. Eternal life is not merely going to heaven when we die. It's the beginning of heaven. Hallelujah. It's the beginning of he heaven in the here and now and that we share in the divine life. This is deep. Church, this is deep. Let me say that again. Eternal life is the beginning of heaven in the here and now and that we share the divine life the everlasting life, and in that are caught up into an intimate fellowship with the Trinity. <laughs> with the Trinity. Gnosko confronts us with the love that God has for us. For we know him only because he has set his love upon us and known us before creating the universe. <laughs> deep, my brother. Deep stuff, man. I'll ask you again. Do you know who you are? Do we know who we are? We're magnificent. Bro, you, you, you're magnificent. Magnificent. Guilt, shame, depression, whatever, has no place here. Has, it, it's not of God. It's not how God feels. It's not what God has given us. It's not what we're empowered to even have even remotely in the same vicinity as us. This is who we are. This is who we are. As you will be in heaven, you're already that right now. Check it out. Our knowing him is our response to his first knowing us. As with Yada, this is not a sentimental feeling, but love that acts. God's not all sentimental about you. No. He loves you. And because he loves you, he acts on that love. 
It's not sentimental. It's fact. It is. It is who he is. Hallelujah. His knowing us took him to the cross. Church. His knowing us took him to the cross. And our love for him is expressed in the joyful doing of his will. I think he earned that right. Help us, Lord. I got to stop for a second. I'm going to pray for us. We're only going to get deeper here, so. You got a minute? <laughs> Father, I know this is deep, man. I, Lord, I know it is. And Lord, I know these things are spiritually discerned. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to do what you do. I'm asking you to help us to understand this stuff, Lord. It is, it is, it's the truth, Lord God. But we want an enemy, and he'll do anything he can to keep us from understanding who we are in you. Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit, please, Father, please do what you said you will do in each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, Lord. So his knowing, his knowing us took him to the cross. Our knowing him should be expressed in joyful doing of his will. We obey him not to gain this divine knowledge, but because it's already ours. Help us, Lord. And we now delight to do as well as a result of this love relationship that we're in. First John 2. Three through six. Now, that, now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him, not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Verse 6, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. I cannot emphasize strongly enough that he first loved us and knew us. I cannot emphasize that enough. He knew what we were all about. He knew what every one of us in this room were before he did one thing for any of us. He already knew us. All about us. Hallelujah. <laughs> and, it's, <clears throat> and it is out of his love and out of his love initiative that we come to know and love him and to walk in his love. Again, we love him because he first loved us. So if that's the truth, right? If that's the truth, that, mean God, that means God, if I'm walking in this covenant, if I'm walking in all that we've been talking about, 15 weeks of this, that means God has enabled me to love him the way he wants me to love him. That means he has endowed in me the ability to love him. And if I love him, what do I do? I what? I obey his word. So stop, church. Stop saying I can't. Stop saying I'm just human. Stop saying, stop, if you mean it. If you really want this, stop. It'd be better off if you just say, you know what? I just don't want it. I just want to live my life the way I want to live my life. Just say it. Stop making excuses. Our first step of love and obedience will be a stumbling 
and very far from perfect. Now, come on, say amen. I know you just want to say amen to that. We've been living it. We've been living it. We've been stumbling along. <laughs> we certainly haven't been doing it perfect. But listen, let me encourage you. The life of God has been born in all of us. And the process of bringing our entire being into the obedience of love has begun, church. And everybody in this room, it has begun. God has begun to perfect every one of us. Just embrace it. We have to embrace it. He'll knock off the edges, man. He'll sand down the rough parts if we let him. But we'll never get that done if we keep making excuses. We'll, it'll never happen if I keep saying, ah, uh, whatever. Well, my father was bad to me when I was a little kid. Okay, who cares? My father's dead. My heavenly father is alive and well. <laughs> right? So I don't have to keep doing that. I could stop doing it. I could stop making excuses. Help me, Lord. Our first step of love and obedience will be a stumbling and very far from perfect. But God has already started the process. This knowledge of him knows continual growth. Listen to this. It's mind-boggling to me, man. I mean, it's not mind-boggling. It's like, why do I even try to, like, you know, like, come up with nonsense? God, God is like 50 million light years ahead of whatever I can possibly dream up in my fat head. You know what I mean? He's like so far down the road, and I'm still over here making little dumb excuses. You know what I mean? He's already light years away going, really, dude? You know? Let's listen to what he says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. God's been saying, Frank, he's, he wrote that, I don't know, 2,000 years ago. He's saying, Frank, how about you just keep growing in grace, man? How about you just keep doing, just keep pressing in, stop making excuses, forgetting what lies behind, press forward, keep moving, keep embracing it, and let me do my thing. Let me do my thing, Lord. So how do we obtain such an intimate knowledge of God? That's the question. Let me try to get through this. Man, we might never get out of here. Sorry. We don't look for this knowledge in Bible study. What? Yeah, we don't look for it in Bible study, which can become arid and lifeless at times. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. And we certainly don't look it in devotionals, all right? Let's <laughs> just say that. That's my own dig. But if you're gonna if you're gonna like do something, read the Bible, all right? Don't read somebody else's stuff. Don't read somebody else's revelation about what God did in their life. Get your own. That's at least better. But still, you don't find a lot. You don't find this kind of intimacy by studying the Bible. We are seeking to know him, not nearly know about him. Like I said, I can read God's autobiography all I want. I'll know a lot of facts, but I won't know him. I won't know him. We're not filing him in a neat category of theology, but growing in a love relationship with him. We're talking, hanging out. Growing, talking, interacting, welcoming him, welcoming, him, welcoming him into every situation that I find myself in. Good, bad, ugly, whatever it is. Everything. And we shouldn't feel that this is for a small elite group within the body of believers. This is for everybody in this room. Every single one of us. He delights to give this knowledge to every single one of his kids. As we've seen, this is the essence of eternal life. To know God. 
This is the essence of eternal life to know God. The promise of the covenant clearly states that it's for everyone that is in the covenant. God said this to us all the way back in Jeremiah in chapter 31. We read this a bunch of times. 31, 34. God is saying to you again and me again, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Why did God forgive us our sins? So that we could know him. So that we could know him. Yada, Old Testament, Gnosko, New Testament. To know him intimately. Everything. Help me, Jesus. The all begins with the least and moves to the greatest in this scripture. As if he would encourage the newest believer and the one who still feels unworthy. This knowledge of God is, all, uh, is for all of you. Every single person in this room. Both Yada and Gnosko speak of the knowing as a lover and as a friend. Now, unfortunately, it's the shock to many who would settle for a life of serving God that above all else, he fervently desires their friendship. It's like Mary and Martha. That's the church, Mary and Martha. One of them wants to clean kitchen and make everything nice. One of them wants to just kneel at his feet. Which one are you? You want to serve them? Do, serve, serve, do? Or you want to just get to know them? Lord. Both. He desires us infinitely more than we desire him. He desires you, George, infinitely more than you desire him. Infinitely. Why can I say that? I just got to look at the cross, brother. <laughs> the gospel calls us to the giddy heights of a relationship of love. Living in the embrace of God who calls us his friends. It's a shame that in the 21st century, many, many have settled for a withered and shrunken theology that reduces the gospel to a way to escape an angry God and to get out of hell. Each of us has been called to intimate friendship with the Lord. A union that is lived out in our homes, in our classrooms, on the factory floor, in the office, in the retail store. We don't have to leave society and become, a, and become religious to enter into an intimate relationship with God. In the middle of the daily ground, grind, with all its demands, with all its responsibilities and activities, we are called to walk with the Lord. Our, our friendship with him becomes the center from which all of life flows in harmony. All of it. On the plane. Wherever. Abraham was called the friend of God. He was certainly not a hermit or a recluse, I'll tell you that. If you study his life, Genesis portrays him as a desert sheik, ruling over his tent kingdom, a rancher and astute businessman having 300 men that he employed. 300 men worked for Abraham in raising his cattle, his sheep and camels, making business deals. He was the friend of God, walking through life, learning to trust the Lord. He wasn't a monk. God touched his everyday dealings, every part of his life. Remember that this is his covenant promise. And therefore, it is backed by the oath of God. 
It is backed by the oath of God. Wherever I am, he is there with me. Wherever I am. Church, this is not an add-on to our life. An extra for the really enthusiastic. But the promise of the covenant ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ. He takes it upon himself to bring us to know him. This knowledge is given by the operation of the Holy Spirit and does, as we have seen, grow throughout our lives. It grows throughout our lives. I am nowhere near the man I was in 1992. But I am nowhere near the man I'm going to be in 2000 whatever. You get it? The more we try to know God by stuffing our heads with religious facts, the further we'll be the further away we'll become from knowing him. We'll just know a bunch of things about him. Conversely, to come to him admitting our helplessness makes us candidates for his implementing of the covenant promises that we've been talking about for the last 15 weeks. This doesn't mean that we all don't need instruction. We do. He has set in the church pastors and teachers for a reason. But the teacher must be very aware of his or her total reliance upon the Holy Spirit. The audience will not understand the teacher unless the Holy Spirit is applying the promises of the covenant. It's the work of God that causes his people to know him. The teacher of truth has been taught of God. And the same spirit is teaching those that he or she is teaching. Both teacher and student must rely heavily on the spirit to teach the heart. If teaching the word of God is the same is in the same category as teaching math, then all we have is an amassing of facts, with the end result being intellectually bloated. <laughs> if the spirit teaches then we are enlightened in our hearts and will be drawn into a close relationship with God and further conform to the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. This is knowledge of God that is not located in the head, but it's located in our heart, church. There's a feeling to this knowledge that doesn't come from understanding a theological problem but a direct and immediate knowing, if you will. An inner knowing, which is independent of instruction by man that brings with it a certainty and a familiarity of God. 1 John 5.10 describes it as the believers having the witness of the Spirit within them. Tragically, we have settled for a lot less than such covenant intimacy. In the parable of the lost son in Luke 15, Jesus described him making the decision to return to the vicinity, if you will, of the old house because of the miserable state his sin has reduced him to. The prodigal son, if you will. He couldn't imagine his father loving him and restoring him. Not after what he did. Not after him. He prepared this speech, if you know the story, he's pathetic. Outlined a business proposition, proposition in which he proposed that he would become a hired servant of his father. Luke 15, 19. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, a hired servant is what we would call a temporary employee. That's what he was asking for. See, servants lived on the property, and they were looked out, they were looked after all year long, whether there was work or not. 
They're part of the family. They lived there. They ate there. They benefited from that. Hired servants were hired by the day when there was too much work for the servants to do, typically during planting season and harvest season. When the lost son proposed that he be made a hired servant, it would be assumed that he would live away from the father's property and he would join the unemployed. He didn't get it, man. He just didn't get it. It described an arm-length relationship with his father and was the best he could imagine considering his past. Some of us keep wanting to think that God holds our past against us. You really have to get over that. You really have to. He's forgotten that. So do you. Jesus then described the father seeing his son when he was still a great way off, the Bible says. I love that. He recognized him as his son, ran to him, embraced him, kissed him, Right? Incredibly, he felt he had to go through with his speech anyway. <laughs> Didn't he? Asking to be a hired hand. And what happened? The father wouldn't even let him finish that mumbo jumbo. Right? Cut him off. And before he could make his proposal, he shut him up. The father didn't want another employee. This man was his beloved son to be robed and shooed and ringed and celebrated with a fattened calf. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In this mad frenzy of doing for God that passes as dedicated Christian living in many churches, we need to ask ourselves a question. Did we come to God to serve him from a fearful distance, or to be the object of his delight and discover our true identity in his love? Did we come to God to serve him from a fearful distance, or to be the object of his delight and to discover our true identity of his love? You see, if I, if I let my past dictate to me, then I'm going to try to keep God at arm's length. When I come to realize how forgiven and loved I am, I can now get in, into his embrace. <clears throat> it would appear that in many cases, the more involved in the church we become, the further away we go from our calling that we were saved to pursue to its fullest potential. The higher we rise in leadership, the more immersed we become in its business, in programs, and in promotion. Listen to what I found online. The pastor of a large church on the West Coast said this, I left everything to give myself to God and serve him. But I realize today I've become a booking agent for the best charismatic act that is passing through town. Another one, having built the largest church in his, in his area, on the night of the dedication, sat fearful in his office, and he said this, Is this it? Is this what I have given my life to? This building has meant my life for years, and now I am already bored with it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The crying need of pastors, priests, and congregations is to realize that Christ died to bring us into intimate covenant relationship with the triune God. That's God's objective. All that other st st stuff is great if we can keep the main thing the main thing. But too often, all that stuff takes us away for what we were really saved to be. In close proximity, intimately involved in God's inner circle and be one of his best friends. Hallelujah. All that other stuff is a distraction. Hallelujah. While we are so busy doing for him, 
we're in danger of missing the whole point of the gospel, which is being with him. How do you define your relationship to God? Ask yourself, how do you define your relationship with God? Is it like an employee answering to a boss? Is it a daily responding to his love? Delighting in him as your dearest friend? Is it doing for him or being in his love? Which one is it? Church, he has many, many servants, but few friends. God wants friends. He don't need me doing nothing. <laughs> he can handle it. <laughs> In Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. If you never read the book of Hosea, you need to. It's a tough book. Pray. Ask God to reveal to you what he's talking about, and he will. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rains on the earth. Thank you, Jesus. The word pursue is better understood as run after with zeal and excitement. Run after the Lord, church. The prophet not only urges us to pursue such knowledge, he assures us that it will be found as surely as the dawn breaks and the rain comes. It's significant that many of Paul's prayers for his converts centered on this idea. I gave you four prayers last week to pray. How many prayed them this week? Be honest. Barely any of you. Barely any of you. I even gave you a, a cheat sheet where you can slide in your Bible. There's a reason for this. And there's a reason why so many of you don't know what I'm talking about. That's one of them. That's one of them. Please do it. Every day. I'm asking you. Every day. Do it. Pray over yourself, them prayers. Pray over them their, your, for your church, for the people who aren't saved that you want saved. Pray over your family, those prayers, four of them. It'll take you like six minutes, maybe. Maybe. Hallelujah. He wanted them to move beyond an intellectual knowledge, a studying of a subject, a knowing about, to this knowledge of intimate experience. Paul got it. Paul got it. Those four prayers that I gave you, he got it. We can do no better than to take one of his requests and make it our life's prayers. You know which one it is? Well, if you read the ones I gave you, you would. To know this love that surpasses all understanding, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Why wouldn't we want to pray that over ourselves and our family every day? Why is that so hard? Why is that such a burden? I'm not trying to guilt anybody here. I'm just trying to open our eyes that your enemy does not want you to get this. And he surely doesn't want your unsaved friends and family to get this. He wants, God wants us to know this love that surpasses all understanding so that we can be filled with all the fullness of God. Help us, Lord. Help us. The response of faith to the gift of the covenant is to surrender. Right now, church, surrender. Surrender. Right now, in this moment, giving all that we know of ourselves to all that we know of him. Help us, Lord. The fact is we know little of ourselves and even less of God. But as we surrender, man, we'll come to know so much more. 
And surrender is not complicated, church. It really isn't. We make it complicated. It's just in the yes, breathed from the heart. Yes, with no promises, only giving thanks for his gift. Yes to his covenant. He did it all. In such a posture of receiving, we give room for the Holy Spirit to work his miracles. We go on to define ourselves by the surrender of the truth that is contained in the covenant. The flesh will always try to define us by our past. Always. But faith surrendering to him defines us by the covenant. There's no past in the covenant. We see and call ourselves by who we are and the light of the gift of love. I wrote down four things. I put them in the bulletin. I did that so you can take them and put them in your Bible along with the other four things that you're not reading. And when you feel it's in the bulletin, we get a bulletin. When you're feeling like that enemy's coming upon you, when you feel the enemy starting to get in your head, you can say these things about yourself. I'm going to read it. I want, you to, I want you to read the answer. You ready? I am limitlessly and unconditionally loved. I am now in covenant with God through Christ. Yes, I, am. I have been included into Christ and am now live and now alive in him. Yes, I am. The spirit is within me, pouring out the love of God in my heart. Yes, he is. My body is the dwelling of the spirit. Yes, he that's who we are. Church, that's who we are. Tell yourself that every day. Read those four scriptures, please. I'm asking you. I'm asking you. If you don't want to pray them over yourself, pray them over me. Pray them. Pray them over our church. Pray them over your family. From such a posture, we shall go on to grow in grace and in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. What I'm talking about today, church, we can know him. We can know who we are in him. We can. It's God's oath. It's his word that says we can, not me. And we will learn how to live here and now as covenant people. As covenant people, bringing the power of heaven to earth. Bringing it here. It's ours. It's already ours. If you're not saved... If you haven't given your heart to Christ, see me at the end of the service. Let's get it done. But if you are, this is yours. It's been yours since that day. Since that day. We just now have to walk in it. We have to believe God. We have to believe his word. Believe who he says we are. Not what our past says we are. Not what any human being says we are. Not even what your mother says you are. But what he says I am. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to have communion. Please don't leave. I know I went a little bit long. Sorry. Not really. Those helping with communion, can you come? Stay. Have communion with us. Stay. Let's have a covenant meal. We can do better. Please. Read the four scriptures every day. Every day. Five minutes. Speak them over your life. Speak them over your family. Speak them over your church. Hallelujah.
There you go. Mic'd up. They want me mic'd up because they want to join at home, those who are at home. Hey, guys that are at home. They want to join us in communion. Can somebody please tell my wife to hurry up?